Welcome to week two of Bible Studies for Life in the winter of 2024. We're excited about this time. Hey, you have a good Thanksgiving? There's, you know, just happened last week, so I hope you had a great Thanksgiving. We're looking forward to now Christmas, right? Well, that's where we're headed, and, and this is a series of of passages that are getting us prepared. We're in the Advent season. So before we dive into Isaiah chapter 8 and 9, I uh, just want to be sure that you, if you haven't already, hit the subscribe button. Just punch that little button. It's real easy. Then hit the thumbs up, like the video. If you want to comment, if you've got a question, if you want to tell us where you're watching from, uh, put that in the comments. And then always, we, we love it if you'll share the video with somebody else, okay? If you want to support our work, you can go to give.exposedtochrist.com and support the teaching and the ministry work that we have as well. All the gifts are tax deductible. You can give them uh, end-of-the-year contributions are welcome. Okay, we're going to look at Isaiah chapter 8 and chapter 9 today. So uh, we're going to start here with the darkness and uh, we said this last week, but I think it's important for us to consider life without knowing Christ before the knowledge. We live on the other side of this, so we really want to try to dive in and understand what was going on. He says, go to God's instruction and testimony. If they do not speak according to this word, there will be no dawn for them. They will wander through the land, dejected and hungry. When they are famished, they will become enraged and looking upward will curse their king and their God. They will look toward the earth and see only distress, darkness, and the gloom of affliction. And they will be driven into thick darkness. This is a key word here. Oh, look, I've changed colors to green. What do you think? It's Christmas. You know, we're doing that. This, look, if, if you don't listen, if you don't follow God's word, there is no dawn, right? And you see this description of the Israelites who are at this place where you can decide to follow the Lord or you can reject him. And if you do, you're going to wander through the land. You're going to be dejected. You're going to be hungry. You're going to be famished. You're going to be enraged. You're going to look up and curse the king and God. And you look down, you look toward the earth, right? You see distress, darkness, gloom. This is, this is the world that, that everyone is in. We're in darkness, but especially the Israelites who had the, the light of life, they had opportunity, they knew God, they, they had all these benefits of God moving in their life, but now because they have rejected him, they're in a place where everybody else who rejects God is. It's darkness and doom and gloom. It's a horrible place, right? And, and I think it's good for us to appreciate the condition of lostness. The condition of, of those who don't know Christ, even today, this is the world they live in as well. It's a, it's a hard place to live. He says, nevertheless, the gloom of the distressed land will not be like that of the former times when he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the future, he will bring honor to the way of the sea, to the land east of the Jordan and to Galilee of the nations. Okay, it's, it's bad, right? But in the future, in the future, I think that word, but it's a great word in, in the Bible, isn't it? But God, all right, in the future, he brings honor to the way of the sea, the land east of the Jordan. Okay, you catch that? The land east of the Jordan and to Galilee of the nations. He will bring honor to them. They will, they will, um, they will have opportunity. There will be opportunity for forgiveness, for grace, for mercy, for light for them. There is this hope that comes, right? And then here, here's the, this you know, poetic statement that Isaiah makes that we, where we get that. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. A light has dawned on those living in the land of darkness. See that word again. You have enlarged the nation and increased its joy. The people have rejoiced before you as they rejoice at harvest time and as they rejoice when dividing spoils. There is joy, right? Joy, rejoiced, rejoice, rejoice, contrasting with darkness. What a great hope, right? There is a statement here of the reality of sin. You're walking in darkness. I didn't write that very well, but look, that's what it's supposed to say. The reality of sin. You're walking in darkness. You're apart from God. You're, you can't see. And, and you're, you can't see your way out. You can't see your way through. This is um, 
sometimes when we're Christians for so long, we forget what it is like to be lost. We forget what it is like to have no hope. We forget what it is like to live in darkness. There is no way through. And, and then here comes this light, right? And it doesn't have to be a bright light. If it's a light that shines when it is total darkness, it is bright, right? It shines bright to those who are in complete darkness. And here, now this light comes. They've seen a great light. The light has dawned and now there is joy. There is joy. People have rejoiced before you. There is joy that comes. This is why we sing joy to the world, right? The Lord has come. This is the light that has come into darkness. For you have shattered their oppressive yoke and the rod on their shoulders, the staff of their oppressor, just as you did on the day of Midian. For every trampling boot of battle and the bloodied garments of war will be burned as fuel for the fire. This is the shattering the oppressive yoke the rod on their shoulders, the staff of their oppressors. There has been victory that has been won, that deliverance from slavery has happened because look what God has done. Okay, we're going to go back here, right? The land east of the Jordan, this is where the Israelites are in captivity. But look, there is joy, right? And there is this setting free from oppression, this this um, deliverance from slavery that comes, right? And then, how does this come? See this, this war, right? Battle, right? This very adult sounding stuff. And then you have this for a child. And it's almost like, well, where's the, where's the warrior, right? No, it's for a child will be born for us. A son will be given to us. And the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace, and the dominion will be vast, and its prosperity will never end. He will reign on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish and sustain it with justice and righteousness from now on and forever. The zeal of the Lord of Armies will accomplish this. Just one thing, when you see that Lord of Armies in the CSB, that's uh, what, if you're reading King James, the Lord of Hosts, right? For a child will be born to us. We, we know this, right? Um, this great prophecy of the coming of the Messiah. The child will be born for us. A son will be given to us. A child and a son. And you, you see this preciousness and this fragility, it seems, right? And yet the strength that is there for the government will be on his shoulders. And, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. Okay, we know that, that there was a misunderstanding among Jewish leaders, scholars in the first century about the Messiah. Um, and especially this argument that Jesus couldn't be the Messiah because he was a man and man can't be a God. But here clearly you see this description of the Messiah as God, right? He is mighty God. He is the eternal father. He is the prince of peace. These words used about him, this Messiah that clearly also fit to who Jesus is. This is who Jesus is. These are the words that are used to describe him. Now and before he went, he came to earth, right? And the dominion will be vast. Prosperity will never end. He will reign on the throne of David and over his kingdom, this vast kingdom. He, he died on a cross and people say, well, how's that? But now we see him as the king of all kings and the Lord of all lords. He does sit on the throne of all of the kingdom of David. That is all those who fall under the rulership of Jesus. He is our king and he is a descendant of David. So he is carrying on this, this kingdom, right? But he is the king of all the kings, right? He establishes and sustains justice and righteousness forever. And then this great promise, the zeal of the Lord will accomplish this. This is a, you see this consistently in the prophets in this statement that God will do this. God will accomplish this. And okay, they looked at this and, and literally for hundreds of years following this, they waited and waited for this. And and what appears here, let's see, back here, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light because these people are in a horrible place, right? And now, now God's going to bring light, but it does not get answered for hundreds of years. 
they waited for hundreds of years. And there could have been a lot of people that wondered, I don't know that God's going to do it. Let me tell you, the zeal of the Lord God Almighty will get it done. God will accomplish his purposes. When I was in college, very quick story. When I was in college, I was at the University of Texas. I went to, with some of my friends, we went to an American atheist meeting because Madeline Murray O'Hare was speaking. Some of you that are my age and older know who that is, right? The leader of the atheist movement in the 60s and 70s and 80s, for sure. And, and one of the things that she said in that meeting was, that Jesus can't be God because he said he was going to come back and he hasn't yet. Well, then there you go. He, he must have been lying, right? Because it hadn't happened yet. Let me tell you, he will come back. The zeal of the Lord of armies will accomplish this. We may not have seen it yet, but that doesn't mean it won't happen. That was the message to the Israelites in the first century. You may not have seen it yet, but that doesn't mean it won't happen. And certainly it did happen in that first century. But for hundreds of years, they waited. And we may have waited for centuries, for millennia, but he will come again. There is always that hope of his return, just as there was that hope of his first coming. There is hope of his second coming. All right. Hope that's helped uh, as you study this. Thank you all for teaching. Boy, I just love seeing those of you that have been watching and that you're teaching faithfully every week. God bless you for that. I really appreciate that you mean so much in the kingdom. We appreciate you for your sacrifice every week to do that. God bless you. Subscribe, like, comment, share with somebody else. We'll see you next week.